This conference will now be recorded. All right, it's official. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Spring 2021 Eco Foci Seminar Series. I am Heather Tabasola. I'm the co-lead with Jens Nielsen, and you should be able to see him up on the screen if you don't know Jens. Um, this seminar is part of NOAA's ECOFOCI biannual seminar series that is focused on the ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, Bering Sea, and U.S. Arctic to improve understanding of ecosystem dynamics and applications of that understanding to the management of living marine resources. Since October 21st, 1986, the seminar has provided an opportunity for research scientists and practitioners to meet, present, and develop their ideas and provoke conversations on subjects pertaining to fisheries oceanography or regional issues in Alaska's marine ecosystems. You can visit the ECOFOCI webpage for more information at www.ecofoci.noaa.gov. And thank you, thank you everybody for joining us today as we continue this all virtual series. We've now been at this a year, which is a really crazy thought in itself. Um, and if you'd like to find our speaker lineup, we um, have talks every week uh, for the month of March. Uh, they can be found at the One NOAA Seminar Series and also on the NOAA PMEL calendar of events. And I believe they're also now at the AFSP calendar of events. Um, moving forward, I know today is a special day. It's a Friday. Moving forward, all talks will be on Wednesdays again through the end of the month. Uh, and if you miss a seminar, we do record them and we will put them up on PMEL's YouTube page. They do take a couple weeks to get up as Jens and I need to review them and make sure uh, words are accurate as we meet um, accessibility standards. Um, so give us a couple weeks, but you are always more than welcome to reach out to the speaker, uh, Jens or myself, um, to get access for when those pop up. Please double check. Oh, oh change is needed and the storybook just describes lots of these tools and i'm going to talk about a few of these tools and give a few illustrations as we as we go through um david is mike and jens just to let you know i did end up having to mute you there so just note that um please double check that your microphones are muted uh that you are not using your video unless you were the speaker um and during the conversation today or the presentation jens will be monitoring uh questions in the chat and we do address those at the end of the talk but please do feel free to type them into the chat feature um go to meeting has changed a little bit you should see a tab at the top with um, people icons and right next to that sort of a, an icon for thought or chat and so um, hopefully you can find that today. I am so, so excited to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Sigler, who is a NOAA retired fishery scientist from Alaska Fishery Science Center um, and also Shoals Marine Lab, currently residing in Bend, Oregon. Uh, Mike led the NOAA Alaska Fishery Center Habitat and Ecological Processes Research Program which included integrated ecosystem research programs in the Bering and Chukchi Seas and ocean acidification research. He retired in August of 2017, and he remains an affiliate professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, where he has taught fisheries population dynamics. He has also led stellar sea lion prey and predation studies, the Alaska Sablefish Stock Assessment, and the Sablefish Longline Survey. He has over 30 years of research experience in Alaska in the areas of marine ecology and fishery stock assessment. And he also co-teaches a class called Integrated Ecosystem Research and Management at the Shoals Marine Laboratory and was a Shoals undergraduate research group mentor in 2020. Mike will be, let's see, talking today on how integrated ecosystem research is a powerful tool for understanding the effect of climate change on Alaska's marine ecosystems. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mike. And just make sure you unmute, because I did mute you. There we go. Well, thanks, Heather, for that. <laughs> thanks for the, uh, having me and listening to me today. So let's see, I got to how do I know? I got to advance it over there. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about climate change in Alaska marine ecosystems. And 
A Tale of Two Cities is a story, uh, a Charles Dickens story of haves and have nots. Uh, in Alaska, it, it is a tale of two ecosystems with ice haves and ice have nots. Uh, in late winter, <clears throat> ice can be very extensive, well down into this uh, southeastern Bering Sea. And, and then by late summer, <clears throat> retreat far to the north. Uh, ice extent in an icy winter can extend past south of the Pribilof Islands. Uh, 2000 to 2010, I know that's historic a uh, long ago now and quite maybe different, but in March and April, you can have up to 60 days of ice cover. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm actually getting ahead of myself. You can have up to 60 days of ice cover to the north and intermittent ice cover to the south. <clears throat> and so in, in a warmer year, I got ahead of myself, ice extent uh, doesn't go quite as far south. So an area of intermittent ice cover and an area of consistent, at least in the past, ice cover. <clears throat> so the northern Bering Sea usually is ice covered in late winter. Southeast Bering Sea sometimes is ice covered. And this is what differentiates the Arctic from the subarctic, usually ice covered. From a <clears throat> bigger view, higher in space, uh, Arctic to the north, subarctic, intermittently ice covered or not at all ice covered to the south, with a boundary along 60 degrees north. <clears throat> and I want to take step aside for a moment and tell you my perspective is a now retired scientist, mostly kind of. I'm going to talk about lessons for conducting integrated ecosystem research and understanding climate change effects. I'm not sure of who else on the call, but <clears throat> I've done quite a lot of fun stuff when I was an active scientist on the trawl survey in 96, holding my favorite fish in the world, sable fish, black cod, uh, working on <clears throat> St. George Island in 2008 with Fish and Wildlife Service biologists, and uh, resting peacefully on a, a northern Bering Sea during a coral survey. Pat Malika claims I was um, sleeping on the job, but I think I was just resting while we were transiting between stations. Uh, my understanding, I, I think an understanding of climate effects, I view it as a three-legged stool. You monitor the system, you add in uh, directed field work, you add in laboratory work, and you use that together to understand these climate effects on the system, see how the system responds, you use that understanding and typically in models, quantitative usually, sometimes qualitative models to forecast effects of <laughs> climate change on the system. So I'll go on uh, to talk about what, how do these differences, how does the art differences manifest themselves between the Arctic and the subarctic? Probably the most prominent difference is besides the ice cover is that uh, harvests of fish in the subarctic are much greater on average averaging 2.2 million metric tons annual harvest close to half the total u.s wild fish capture in contrast just to the north the harvests are typically less than 1,000 metric tons annually and they primarily are used as subsistence uh, for uh, coastal communities there's a huge several orders of magnitude difference in the annual harvest in, uh, in Alaska waters between the two systems. This reflects differences in the fish abundance. Uh, an, a paper by Stevenson and Lauf with many more fish, high, much higher densities of fish uh, to the south uh, compared to the north. There are other tax differences between the Arctic and the subarctic. I've published a couple papers on zoogeography. For example, gray whales, Arctic cod to the north and the Arctic, and <clears throat> pollock cod, fin and humpback whales to the south. Quite differences in the zoogeography. Uh, there's differences in how the sun's energy is taken. It's more often intercepted in the water column by phytoplankton and zooplankton in the subarctic. 
and instead it's directed much more to the to the benthic to the benthos in the Arctic. Uh, ice algae occurs both in the and <coughs> uh, uh, th throughout the Arctic system, and and the ice algae occurs on the underside of the ice <coughs> in spring. It adds an energy, uh, an important energy source when it falls to the sea floor during following ice melt. <clears throat> and it's a, a large benthic input. And notably, I worked with Phyllis and Cal Morty. <clears throat> we published a paper in 2020. We argue and provide evidence that in the shallower Chukchi Sea, this ice algae, <clears throat> which can fall, fall below the photic zone in other systems, deeper systems, but the Chukchi is about 45 meters and can, primary production continues near the seafloor of this ice algae through the summer. In the southeastern Bering Sea, with the phytoplankton blooms, with an early ice retreat, uh, this is a well-known story. Uh, if there's early ice retreat, the bloom is delayed until solar stratification occurs, which results in mostly small copepods. In contrast, with late ice retreat, an ice-associated bloom, an earlier bloom, primarily results in large callinus. This is an ice edge effect. And this spatial matching, when the ice retreats late, so you have a cold winter with a, a late ice retreat, the large zooplankton that are ice edge affiliated, matched with the juvenile fish. This effect was first described by Yvette Sidden, who I teach with. Yet if there's a warm winter with early ice retreat, there's a spatial mismatch. So plankton is still ice affiliated, but no longer matching with the juvenile fish. <clears throat> and this favors uh, the abundance of young uh, fish such as pollock. There's a very recent paper by uh, this talks about pollock, large and small zooplankton. There's a recent paper by Jim Thorson, Yumi Aramitsu, and others <clears throat> trying to look at how does this these spatial effects manifest for other taxa besides pollock in those species, and they found that <clears throat> uh, the ice edge, the cold pool extent, is a widespread effect affecting many, many taxa and dictating those spatial distributions over many, the, the last 30, basically over the last 30 years. We can compare the Chukchi, again, a, another spatial idea. We can compare the Chukchi and Bering Seas. As I mentioned, the Chukchi is much shallower than the uh, Bering Sea, averaging. Uh, less than 45 meters typically. In contrast, the Bering Sea, <clears throat> mid shelf is already at 70 meters. So when ice algae falls to the seafloor, you can have continued primary production near the seafloor. But you, that does not occur. The, the ice algae falls to the seafloor in the ice covered regions of the Bering Sea. And that does, it, does not continue to occur. So this adds another layer of production uh, to the Chukchi Sea above what occurs in the Bering Sea, even in the ice covered areas, because of that primary production near the seafloor. <clears throat> so we can look at uh, the bloom timing for this uh, ice algae that's falls to the seafloor, and we can compare bloom onset. When does the uh, algae fall to the seafloor? And, and then the bloom continues compared to when the ice retreats. There's a statistically significant relationship of that near seafloor ice algae production to ice retreats. So it's again, it's an ice associated bloom, a bloom, a little term, but the, uh, the ice algae continuing to primarily produce. And this is that same plot. <clears throat> I'm going to add a little bit more to it in a moment. 
So these, this relationship here between ice retreat and bloom timing index. We can add information from an older paper that Phyllis and I did and others. <clears throat> Uh, the southeastern Bering Sea, actually for the northern Bering Sea, M5 and M8, M2 and M4 down here. I want to point out these are near bottom moorings in the Chukchi. These are near surface moorings to the south. So there's a little bit. There's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison here. Yet we can look for shared relationships. So there's the open water bloom I pointed out before early ice retreat, a bloom that occurs with solar stratification. And then we can look at a later bloom. These are all ice associated blooms. And it's, it's well known that the timing of the bloom is affiliated with the ice retreat. It's a well known relationship, but I think it's pretty cool to see this relationship from the southeastern Bering Sea, northern Bering Sea, into the Chukchi, and it and it delaying in concert with the ice retreat. It's a it's a pretty neat relationship built on all this mooring data uh, to see. So next, I so I talked about the two ecosystems. I'm next going to talk about the climate change effects. <clears throat> so icy winters, lots of sea ice. Icy winters occur when winds are from the north and Arctic in origin. What's happened recently, there have been years of uh, maybe a gradual decrease, but dramatically lower ice in the Bering Sea uh, over these years, these many years. Uh, next, horsemen, marine heat waves. There's been two dramatic heat waves in the last decade, very extensive. The blob, Nick's, Nick Bond's word. And likewise, a publication by John Walsh et al. <clears throat> there has been heat waves in the past, but this last couple have been pretty uh, dramatic. Ocean acidification, so unlike Temperature related climate effects, which vary interannually or can sometimes vary in stanzas, there is a steady increase. This is a, a Mauna Loa atmosphere and ocean indices, but there's a steady increase in ocean acidification. There's a seasonal, there's a seasonal component, but the annual increase is much steadier than the ocean temperature effects. That's one difference with ocean acidification, ocean temperature effects. The other is that, <clears throat> this is an older paper by Dick Feely, um, but it shows this dramatic difference in the saturation depth. In other words, like where are the corrosive waters? How shallow or deep are they? There's much shallower in the Pacific than they are in the Atlantic. That's due to the uh, how the ocean currents carry water and the age of the water, but the calcium carbonate horizons are about 100 meters compared to something like one to 2,000 meters in the Atlantic. And the effect on the ecology on the biological organisms <clears throat> is that many calcified organisms in the North Pacific, for example, the, this is some work that Bob Stone did and others, on coral distributions there and the Aleutians, which are known as this really coral abundant place, yet many of these <coughs> corals are in undersaturated waters. So they're already dealing somehow with uh, ocean acidification. So I did say there's four horsemen, but I like this metaphor and analogy so much, but there's only really three horsemen of climate change. The next thing in Alaska, the next thing I want to talk about is changes, what has changed due to climate, how have we used those changes and what we observe to make predictions or forecasts, and where did we make mistakes in making those forecasts, and what can we learn from those mistakes? So sea ice is a fleet feeding platform for Pacific walrus. Uh, life is good when there's ice there and then they're above the benthic organisms they prey upon. 
In contrast, as the ice is out, they haul up on the shore. They're much farther from their <clears throat> prey and work by Chad Jay et al. has shown effects of this loss of sea ice. Much lower foraging efficiency. Uh, marine heat waves affect fisheries. Uh, warm, this is uh, essentially Gulf of Alaska, not strictly, but warm is good. Juvenile sablefish going through the roof. In contrast, the well-known story is not really bad for uh, juvenile Pacific cod in the Gulf of Alaska. They affect other taxa, uh, common MERS, uh, widespread die-off here documented by John Pye and others uh, due to the uh, recent heat wave. <clears throat> they talk about why, well, common MERS eat more than 50% of their own body mass in fish every day. That's a heck of a lot of foraging. When times are good, there's lots of fat prey and uh, for them to forage on, chicks survive, uh, as do adults. In contrast, during the heat wave, prey were fewer, skinnier. There was re widespread reproductive failures and adult, and adult mortalities of a very long, quite long lived uh, seabird. Predictions. <clears throat> so, uh, so predictions are based on understanding that three-legged stool is I said that in a uh, cold winter they have the ice edge effect of the good uh, a, a plant of uh, 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 bloom large copepods are favored the understanding of this relationship can be used and the, uh, then in then producing strong ear class of for example Pollock this understanding can be used to create statistical relationships, uh, uh, a well-known paper by Franz Muter et al. <clears throat> of temperature of this temperature juvenile survival, juvenile Pollock is uh, estimates here, and that is used in concert with the population dynamics model to forecast biomass into the future, a slow but steady decline. They're forecasting slow but steady decline in Pollock biomass. So the imp important point, the three-legged stool of monitor, understand, use the understanding to forecast using here a statistical relationship to forecast the effects of climate change. Um, there's a new paper out by Lisa Eisner et al. <clears throat> that goes further in, in a sense of forecasting using a farther ahead forecast. So you can have a, a forecast based in now to forecast just three years ahead, which for stock assessment and fishery management, that immediate thing is a really good thing. So it's again, but again, it's using understanding of the of copepods, the relationships, and using that statistical relationship to estimate three years ahead pollock abundance. It makes Jimmy and Ellie's job easier. <clears throat> Another fish prediction, <clears throat> uh, it's been documented for probably 15 years now that winds affect uh, flatfish uh, recruitment survival. For example, Northern Rock Sole, uh, wind-driven evection blows them into their nursery areas. Uh, there is, so you would think that winds in the right direction will help them, uh, however they are, as flat, typical flatfish, a density dependent population control, um, so that <clears throat> with forecasted winds are, are forecasted to increase with climate change in the right direction. <clears throat> However, the density dependent effects will mitigate that effect so that on average, uh, instead of going up some, the northern rock solar forecasts are predicted, uh, Tom Wilderbeer et al. To, remain about the same. Uh, moving on to another warm-blooded animal, <coughs> a ribbon seal prediction. It's, there's four ice-dependent seals. They depend on ice for pupping, nursing, and molting. Um, <coughs> and this is a qualitative prediction. There's quantitative predictions of ice extent uh, here of what's current 
And what's forecast, the forecast is for now 40 years ahead for reduced sea ice in this area. The connection to the seal productivity is qualitative. The climate model part is quantitative. But in this uh, review by led by Peter Bovang, status review, they stated that the seals, even though there's going to be reduced ice in their pupping areas or nursing areas, that these seals will adjust at least in part to these changes by shifting breeding locations in response. In other words, they'll, they'll move a bit north to respond to reduced ice conditions. But again, they're using understanding to make a prediction about what, how climate change will affect <coughs> this ice dependent species. An ocean acidification example, red king crab, a calcareous organism. There's been a heck of a lot of work done at the Alaska Tree Science Center on, in experiments on effects on crab and fish. And uh, for red king crab <clears throat> uh, uh, in tanks, put the animals in tanks, see how they survive in this case juveniles survive to 100 days clear ph effect ocean acidification effect and then they they were combined with uh, population models and climate forecasts of ocean conditions and the prediction is <clears throat> for uh going catch to go to zero by the end of the century hopefully that's not the case but um that's that's the Prediction based on the understanding provided in this case by lab experiments uh, to for this species and this fishery. So you can have more complicated predictions and ask bigger questions. Is ecosystem-based fishery management beneficial against climate change effects? And in 2020, there was an estimated total fish population of 19 million metric tons in the Eastern Bering Sea. And that's a lot of fish for seabirds, mammals, and people. The allowable bio to catch, if you add up all the individual assessments on what they think you can extract from the Bering Sea, it comes up to 3.3 million metric tons of fish. <clears throat> and there's a, however, there's a catch cap that caps the total ecosystem extraction at 2 million metric tons, again, from the Eastern Bering Sea, which leaves more prey for seabirds and marine mammals. Still, people get a lot to eat, but it leaves more prey <clears throat> for other parts of the ecosystem. And Kirsten Holzman and others, they led a paper to try to understand, does this CAP system, that ecosystem-based fishery management tool, does that have some derived benefit against the effects of climate change? So again, a model with climate scenarios, an ocean model, indices derived from the ocean model. Kirsten has a, a multi-species fish model called Seattle which is then tied to a socioeconomic model. They wanted to know if a cap, the 2 million metric ton cap versus no cap, in other words, for example, this year catching 3.3 million metric tons, does this ecosystem base, this green control, help against the effect of climate change? And they found that, yes, I'm just showing one example of it, a result, but they found that into the future, in the interval 2025 to 2050, having the cap reduced the chance of a more than 10% decline in catches from 65 to 32, 65% to 32%. In other words, you're more likely to have some catch stability if you have this cap in place. Eventually it breaks down after 2050, but I would point you to the this this good, nice paper to look at those more detailed results. But the big point is that yes, there is a effect to mitigate against climate change based on already in place rules for the Bering Sea fisheries management. <clears throat> so 
So what about mistakes and what can we learn from mistakes? Uh, warming is good was the original version of the, of the oscillating control hypothesis, first published by George Hunt, Phyllis Stabenow and others in 2002. And they explain based on the existing information on why this was true. And they hypothesize that warming would favor zooplankton. No, no classification by size, just zooplankton. And then lead to good fish abundance. Um, we used uh, this original hypothesis to structure the Bering Sea project. It was one of the main, uh, one of five main hypotheses of that project. And I'm going to argue that learning occur occurs through having hypotheses, using the structure of your work to direct your work, help pull the, the whole train goes in the same direction. Um, <clears throat> and that specifically, that hypothesis was that later spring blooms will increase zooplankton production, therefore resulting in increased production abundances of piscivorous fish. Well, it turns out we did the work and there was also uh, intermediate years of <clears throat> study by Ecofoci and others. And instead, the finding was that warming is bad. And I've already explained this show that at the beginning of my talk, <clears throat> for two reasons, warming disfavors large zooplankton. And this is this mod disfavors large zooplankton. And it's not just spring that matters, that winter, overwinter survival, being fat and happy as you come into winter really does matter. This was revised by Hunt et al. in 2011 <clears throat> based on these results and the revised acidity control hypothesis. And our hypothesis also was revised instead of increase, decrease, instead of increase, decrease. And, and in this case, it was through a very large program, of course, as most everybody knows, but it's a, it is the structure, it's the, the hypothesis structures our understanding of how the Bering Sea works. <clears throat> and learning occur, occurred through a hypothesis and integrated ecosystem research, that very large IERP, the Bering Sea project. So a second point I want to make about integrated ecosystem research <clears throat> is that if we go in the lab, we can collect a data point, blast the data points very quickly. If we do directed field research, we can we can conceivably collect lots of uh, data points very quickly, have good sample sizes. But in understanding climate ecosystem effects, each year is a data point. So, for example, uh, you know, in the late 90s, there was a, a cold year followed by a warm year, a cold year, a warm year, cold year. And a lot of this was the basis for the original acidity control hypothesis. Then there were several warm years, and then during the Bering Sea project, several cold years. Since then, you've had some variation else like earlier. My main point though is that in trying to understand how does the system respond to climate, each of these years is a point. A cold year, you get to see, yes, ice-associated bloom, lots of large zooplankton, lots of pollock. That's your one data point. And that's so it takes a lot of time to accrue data for these for climate understanding, climate ecosystem understanding. <clears throat> So another prediction I, uh, from the Bering Sea project, so we, once we did this large IERP, uh, we made a prediction about what will happen to the Northern Bering Sea. So this is what I said we saw in 2001 to 10 on average, uh, nearly always ice covered. And modeling also, was used. So this is monitoring to understand the system. This is modeling to help us understand the system and a forecast. So this says the Bering Sea will be uh, still at least have some ice cover into the future during April. But in fact, you know, you guys after I retired experienced some, something quite different. There's some been pretty dramatic drops in ice cover in the last couple last few winters much below the 
historical envelope, much below the average down in here. And <clears throat> this warming, so warming has occurred much faster than expected, a mistake. And uh, for example, uh, Janet Duffy Anderson and others tried to understand what were the ecosystem consequences of these changes. And it, the model still followed the pattern of not having ice associated blooms where there was no ice and far to the farther to the north there was. But in that much of the Bering Sea, those effects <coughs> occurred throughout the system, again, of skinnier, fewer prey, adult mortalities, and uh, reproductive failures, for example, for common MERS and other species. <clears throat> so an open question is whether fish will move northward. So this is that pattern I showed from Yvette's paper, uh, 2013 paper of match and mismatch. So now, <clears throat> as the ice more commonly is to the north, and as I understand it, the zooplankton are still, the large zooplankton are still affiliate with that ice edge. So they're still somewhere in the Bering Sea. So it's an open question, will these fish move northward to match that? Will, will they find it? Will their offspring that are happen to be up there by chance be more successful and on average uh, lead to uh, the, the fish stocks moving north for, reproductively. Um, you can look at it a couple ways. You can use a lab study. This is a very nice study by Ben Laurel et al. looking at <clears throat> how does growth vary with temperature for all the four gadded species. And you can use, uh, how, I think I said growth rate, how growth rate varies with temperature. And you can use this to forecast where you expect fish to be successful and they're likely to occur uh, given forecasts of ocean temperatures across, for example, the Bering Sea. We can see from bottom trial surveys that fish are moving north. This is for pollock, but also I understand it's true for cod. A, a, a widespread bottom trial survey in 2010, Pollock were on the outer shelf, <clears throat> shelf rate. And in uh, 2017, they were also found to the north, but not in 2010. Um, we can try to wonder, so if cod also did the same thing, now they've moved north a warmer year, they're up here, what are they gonna do when the ice returns? I just saw a talk by Julie Nielsen, a, a study with her and Suzanne McDermott and others of uh, tagged Pacific cod with pop-up archival tags with light sensors so you can infer where they're located. Will, will these fish, uh, up here, will they move south again as ice comes or will they stay up here? What, what's the pattern? So we're trying to use a directed field, they're trying to use a directed field, field study to understand this effect of climate. And they estimated the probable locations of the of 24 tags. <clears throat> they, were, they were first tagged around St. Lawrence Island. So summer, where, where are they gonna go? So as I as the fall came on, they spread out at least, and as ice formed, and then and then moved south, they seem that the cod are moving in front <clears throat> of the ice. They're responding to the temperature, uh, the, the temperature, the ice cover. Into February, now they're on the outer shelf where they would usually spawn and then as the spring came they and ice diminishes it looks like they uh, returned back north the numbers are much smaller and Julie and Suzanne asked me to say this is a preliminary result but they did it's cool it's a directed field study that let us under lets us understand what is what is the response of cod to <clears throat> climate change and how does it respond to a more specific question about uh, ice extent? So to conclude, I would I would 
argue in this case trying to understand fish moving northward and also what, how do other taxa respond, seabirds, ice seals, and so forth. As you are already doing, monitoring the system, the environmental conditions, as well as the fish and crab species that are, that are there, directed lab studies, uh, directed field work like the ta like Ben study, directed field work like Suzanne and <coughs> Julie study, monitoring, and if and if they're tied together like you typically do, that's integrated re ecosystem research that you can be used as you are doing to understand climate effects in the system, understanding what's happening now, how to manage the fisheries in response, how to <coughs> manage uh, birds, seabirds, and marine mammals in response and also forecast what's gonna happen. So I have take homes on the Alaska marine ecosystem side. Uh, ice is king, warming is occurring, and there are, as you all know, there are broad ecosystem effects. My specific points to me that I'm adding in some cases on e integrated ecosystem research, <clears throat> We can understand climate effects through a three-legged stool of monitor, understand, and then forecast. That learning occurs through hypotheses and making predictions and sometimes mistakes and still learning from that. And in understanding climate ecosystem effects, <clears throat> one year is one data point. And last, I'd say, if you're an undergraduate, come and take our class. Uh, Myself, Yvette Sidden, and, and Jen C.V. and Chris Sidden. Thanks for listening. Ah, thank you, Mike. Such a good talk. You encapsulate so much of the work so, so very well. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> uh, folks, if you would like, um, we can do questions in chat. I know a lot of you haven't seen Mike in a while, so maybe you want to jump on camera and just let me know that you have a question and I can run through names and you can ask him directly. Um, I feel like everybody at this point used to Zoom, so it's not such a gamble like we had a year ago. Um, sorry, I'm just switching up my views here. So if folks do have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We do have about um, 10, 12 minutes until 11. Um, and obviously if folks need to go, you can go. Um, Libby has a question. Lib Libby's question. I have heard some propose that climate change is happening so fast that EBM or ecosystem-based management can't make a difference. What are your thoughts on that, Mike? Um, so fast that EBM cannot make a difference. I, well, I certainly wouldn't use it as a tool to say I'm trying to stop the effects of climate change. Um, but I, I, I would, I think that Kirsten et al's paper would argue otherwise, <clears throat> but I think that effect stops in, um, well not stops, not so black and white, goes away in, in 30 years. I think there's certainly room for more studies <clears throat> uh, to test that under different conditions. That was a three species test. Um, I think it doesn't <clears throat> necessarily apply to the Gulf of Alaska where there is no cap. There are buffers on based on single species, but there's no multi-species buffer in the catch quota system. So that's a pretty dramatic drop from the total quotas <clears throat> of uh, uh, one third top, off the top in the Bering Sea. And I don't. I also don't think it. <clears throat> uh, I think you're. You, you could be true in the sense that that's ecosystem-based management for uh, directed at fish. It will help the seabirds and the marine mammals, but it's not explicitly helping this other species that fish and wildlife and 
marine fisheries know it uh, manages. So I'd say it's a bit of a yes, you're right. Uh, no, you're wrong, but yes, you're right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Jim Overland asks, uh, is the effect of the cap due to that it's fixed um, rather than year to year variable or other effect? I think it's mostly because it's fixed and because so there's a spot you can't go above <clears throat> and it's quite a bit below what the quote is typically add up to be. That's why it, it's a significant cap, unlike the Gulf of Alaska, where the cap is actually. There's a 700. It's it's quite different. So I think if they're um, I, I, yeah, I think I think that's 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 an, that's good enough to say for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Just some comments as well. Uh, James Wombles says, thanks, Mike. Great presentation and synthesis. And Roger was here, Roger Griffiths. He says, so good to hear and see you, Mike. Thanks for the thanks, outstanding Roger. presentation. I miss your wisdom and great ability to communicate the complexities and importance of integrated ecosystem research. Thanks for all you did and are doing. Help us advance. Missing you. I'm sure you could read that too, but. Thanks, Roger. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, Okay, Roger says, if you had limited funds and could only advance one leg of the stool, which one would you put it on for biggest bang for the buck to advance climate ready LRM management? Um, I don't like questions like that because I appreciate what Roger's trying to do, but I think it's more a question of what region you prioritize and how you do it. For example, when I was not much before I was retiring within the Recruitment Processes Alliance, we had a lot of discussion of how to keep some monitoring on the Eastern Bering Sea and yet take care of the Gulf of Alaska. And there was a kind of a full money approach, a full fledged approach in the Bering Sea going on. And we had some discussion, could you reduce that down to less to try to take some of the asset and put it into the Bering Sea? Uh, into the Gulf of Alaska. <clears throat> and I think that's a more productive way to think about it. Can we still, once we understand a system, can we reduce our uh, uh, effort there <clears throat> and move on to another system? And I, get, and I guess a corollary to that would be that you would often, we're going to make sure we have enough money into a spot to understand it well, sort of like a directed IERP. And then we're gonna then we're gonna back off once we spend three to five years in that system and then <clears throat> do some monitoring because one data point is one year for climate ecosystem effects and then move on to the next region for our IERP. Uh, Martin, Martin Doran is here and he says, what do you think about using a dynamic cap to deal with changing productivity due to climate change? Yeah, along Jim's question, I I I think that's possible. I I, I think it's though those are kind of like those are modeling questions. I I think that it, which I don't have a particular insight. I think like the stuff that Kirsten did, you you apply the same approach to other systems, the Gulf of Alaska or whatnot, <clears throat> to try to see if you if that how that'll work and test the system. Um, I think. To go a little bit back to Jim's question, I think the cap in the Bering Sea has worked is because it's been so much below what the total addition of individual species allowable catches would be. And if you wanted to, in, in the Bear in the Gulf of Alaska, there's none. So if you, you would use modeling like Kirsten's modeling to answer Martin's question to try to understand can we catch some up more? Could we go to 2.5 million metric tons, or could we have a dynamic in the uh, Bering Sea? Uh, and a crew more uh, uh, catch. I would also, though, I think, you know, we need to make sure we explicitly do more to make sure there's enough food for the mammals and the, and the seabirds. There's a great paper by Curry et al. and seabirds leave one third for the birds. And there should be in these considerations of models, which I think is the 
the best tool, we want to make sure that we consider the other parts, the ecosystem, not just the, the fishermen and the food that we bring back to our tables. Other questions from folks? I'll ask, uh, oh, wait, here's one. Mm, oh, thanks, Jens. Okay, Jens's question. Your hypothesis for the bearing suggests warming, less ice, later bloom, leads to decreased conditions for higher trophic level species, large zooplankton, et cetera. How does that fit with suggestions that higher net primary productivity derived from satellite studies, Brown and Arrigo, and in situ studies will increase with warming temperatures? Right. So that's that would be that's kind of like a Ken Coyle question. So, you know, Ken in his work on the oscillating control hypothesis, he specialized in how intermediate. I think it's a 2011 paper, how intermediate steps can suck up some of that primary production. And so it might not always go to the fish. It might get trapped in a, a lower part of the trophic web. And um, it's not necessarily going to go and benefit the fish, birds, and mammals, the upper trophic, the upper trophic levels like ourselves. So I think understanding those intermediate steps are important to you know, answering the question that Jens is, is asking. Other questions from folks? Jens says thank you. Okay, and agrees. <laughs> um, all right, Calvin, Calvin Morty asks, recent models also suggest a decline in nutrients over the shelf in the coming decades. Oh, Cal Calvin's apparently commenting. I thought it was a question. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from folks? We do have a couple more minutes. Um, I was going to say, Mike, since you gave this talk to Isla Scholes, which is obviously um, at least the class that you do with undergraduate, and all I noticed, all of the examples that you used in this presentation are conglomerates of so many different people who who like we know within RPA, um, the Recruitment Process Alliance, within Ecofoci, partners. Is there any, like have the, have the students ever picked up on this? Do you have suggestions to them on how, you know, e integrated ecosystem research works and the, the large groups of people that you get to work with or have to work with to make this happen? Do you have, do you address that at all with them or sage advice for those who are here, just how to work in those kind of groups and how to make it happen. So I'm talking to to professionals like yourself now or students like at Shoals. Pick, you can do both. <laughs> but student. Uh, I think um, for professionals, it's collaborating outside your discipline, still maintaining your expertise in your discipline, but reaching out to people in other parts of the system and working with them. And my best ex the example I always go back to, Vernon Bird, who is a fish and wildlife service seabird biologist, he published a paper just on seabirds and then used ocean conditions nearby. And it was a nice paper, but it didn't really use all the information around the seabird colonies and Pribilofs to answer his questions. The Bering Sea Project, we provided that expertise, you know, fish biologists and physical oceanographers to explain what was going on with seabirds on this, this, these, this, these islands. So, there was power through this collaboration. Um, with the students, I tr uh, tried, Ibat and I, <clears throat> we try to focus on explaining to them a, in a similar way about how you want to uh, reach out to, actually a way I've talked about it. A lot of times a student will come to me and say, I'm a seabird biologist. And I'll go, well, why don't you just say you're a marine ecologist who wants to focus on seabirds? because you're in a better spot. If you're trying to understand <clears throat> why seabirds aren't doing well on an island or, or uh, what's going on in the whole system. So you're trying to look at the ecology of the system from a bigger picture. You can focus on your seabirds, but you're trying to think about it from a broader perspective. I'm a seabird, I wanna go eat. Where am I gonna go? I'm gonna lay my eggs, where am I gonna go? 
what are the conditions there and so forth. So think of yourself for the students more as a marine ecologist. And, and just like my word, advice to professionals, collaborate and collaborate, work, reach out to other people. You're gonna gain a huge amount in your discussion parts of your paper. You're gonna add a lot to the discussion part of your paper, unless it's a pretty narrow paper, if you have other people that are in other disciplines that you're collaborating with. Thanks for that. I always find that ecofoci is a is a good indicator of what collaboration should be in RPA and in the Alaska Bering Group. And mm -hmm. the IRPs were great for I think adding to the collaborations that were already in the AFSC. I think they've made a huge and you guys. It's really cool. Like I said, uh, sort of offline. It's really cool to see all the work that's being done in the last five years, considering how much is changing in the in these systems. Yeah. Alex was here and he said, and Alex Andrews, and he said, enjoy your presentation. Thanks, Mike. Mary Beth Decker, great point, Mike, about collaborating. Enjoyed your talk. Um, Diane Poster um, was here and she said, great presentation. Thank you. And, and Ben says, hey, Mike, how about those sable fish? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I, I've been teased by Dana Hanselman about my predictions for sablefish stock assessment back when I was doing it, and uh, he he claims he does much better. I think he just lucked out by having a bunch of really good year classes. So, <laughs> all right, I would, I'll add before everybody gets off. Anybody has any questions? Feel free to contact me, and 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 we can chat. Yeah, and say uh, hello it, too. It is eleven. Please make sure to say hi. Uh, to Mike, if you'd like to. Uh, again, we did record this presentation. It does take a couple weeks to go up on YouTube. Uh, so don't expect it too soon. But if you'd like to see it sooner, um, I can oftentimes share a link uh, if you have an immediate need uh, for that. And again, we're, we are here uh, starting next week on Wednesdays through the end of the month. So thank you everybody for being here. And I'm gonna stop recording and then folks wanna. <laughs>